Thank you, Charlie, and hello, everyone. My name is Jacob, um, and I manage and maintain the open source frameworks on the JavaScript side for Langchain. Thrilled to be here talking to you guys about some ways you can use state to build better large language model powered apps in the browser. And we've seen some amazing use cases to date um, and so far during this conference around sort of these image gen and multimodal models. I'm gonna be talking more about uh, text-based LLMs where you know, a lot of reasoning happens, more kind of these uh, intelligent apps that you see like in other places. And yeah, so we heard some awesome talks from Charlie just now from WebLLM, uh, Joshua from Hugging Face, and with the work the Chrome team is doing, um, developing a built-in browser inference API, I think you know, we can say the future's almost here, the writing's on the wall. Small LLMs are more accessible than ever and are fast approaching the mainstream. And what I'd like to explore today is how we can do something useful with them. And I'm gonna be breaking this down into mostly kind of two steps. Uh, the first being tactics and the second strategy. Tactics being improving individual calls and single you know, sort of chat type use cases. And strategy being how to get the LLM, the right broad awareness of the problem you're trying to solve at a given time. So let's set the stage with some tactics. And a small language model, if you've ever tried it out, can be a little bit limited on its own. And especially compared to frontier models like you know, the bigger Gemini models or OpenAI or Anthropic, um, they don't follow instructions as well all the time. And what I mean by this, as an example, I asked Phi 3.5, uh, which is one of the state-of-the-art small models currently out by Microsoft, and I ran this using WebLLM, make edits to a specific input text while returning these edits as diffs. And my intention was to apply those diffs via code afterwards as part of a longer running workflow. What the model responded with was, and this isn't verbatim, but something like, here's the full regurgitated text with some minor edits, and by the way, here's a couple of lines of like the format you requested. You can see the reference link at the, below, um, at the bottom um, is a trace of the call. If you have the slides afterwards, you can check out the full interaction. Um, but basically, if you want to use this as a step in a workflow, you're gonna have trouble extracting just the pieces you want because getting to follow the formatting that you need is difficult. Another limitation is that they can be prone to hallucination. And I'm sure most of you know what this term means by now. And I might be dating myself, uh, which is funny. I do work with a 19-year-old. And uh, if I ask a simple question, the same model, 5.3.5, who is Dr. Evil? Um, does anyone not know who Dr. Evil is? I guess that's maybe a show of hands. OK, good. Yes, haven't dated myself too badly. Um, but I'm sure most of you know the answer to this one. He's a character from the movie Austin Powers, a funny villain type character. But I asked Phi 3.5 this, and Phi did not know the answer. It thought it was from a movie called Wedding Crashers, which you know is a little bit, uh, and you know, 1994. I don't know, maybe there was a character. I never actually saw the original, so maybe I'm dating myself now. But um, it thinks he's a British actor named British La uh, John Leguiz Leguizamo. I don't know. And you can see the response. You know, it knows it's like a character. And it's kind of close, but this is actually kind of like worse than useless for building useful apps because it's the kind of thing where you might, or some future step might think this sounds plausible, like kind of pass it through just fine. It'd be better if it was like even completely wrong rather than like kind of partially wrong. So these are two big examples of limitations that kind of boil down to a similar problem, which is that the model lacks relevant context as to what you're trying to do. And by the way, I'm not saying this to dunk on Phi and small models in general. This applies to all LLMs. Even the biggest and best models can hallucinate at given points. And a good strategy to combat this is simple, and that is provide the context. And to get the LLM, for example, to follow instructions better, you can use a technique called few shotting, which is when you give the LLM some examples of how to respond to your given input. So in this one, I am, oops, not sure how to go back, but Basically giving the, thank you, uh, giving the LLM some examples of the format I want, saying like an example of how you should respond uh, with edits is like edit one, edit two, edit three, and I might get edits in the format I want without having to parse out a bunch of nonsense or kind of boilerplate. For hallucinations, uh, grounded generation or retrieval augmented generation or RAG, which you might have heard of, it's a pretty hot topic these days, is basically grounding your responses in known factual data that you might retrieve some, from something called a vector store from some other source. And that's basically saying, you know, if I ask who is Dr. Evil, let's say I have a vector store or sort of other data source populated with 
data from IMDb, and it says, Dr. Evil, maybe there's multiple Dr. Evils too, so you don't know. Uh, but you say, Dr. Evil is a character from Austin Powers, and then the LLM goes, okay, this, this Dr. Evil, uh, it's somewhere in my training data, I know who that is, I can give some additional, use that to like sort of hone in on the um, right Dr. Evil and give some more context around who that is. And another general tip is to say, if you have a small LLM to answer Y scope query, you're probably gonna be a little bit disappointed. If you ask a small LLM to answer world hunger and the energy crisis, you're gonna get a worse response than something like, oh, maybe OpenAI's newest model zero one, which is reasoning, and maybe could go through some steps and actually come up with a good response. You're gonna have some trouble. And KIRS, keep it really simple. If you ask something simple, you're gonna be a lot better off. You're gonna be a lot happier in general. What's one food you can eat? A hamburger, why not? And this is all well and good, but what if you do need something more complex? After all, LLMs are prone to distraction, especially as your instructions become more elaborate. So, you know, to do something really useful, you're, you know, asking like, what's one food you can eat is nice, but not gonna be terribly useful in most cases, on its own at least. And here's where we get, uh, where we get into some of these strategy pieces. And so to answer this properly, let's take a little trip, dating myself again, maybe all the way back in time in the DeLor uh, DeLorean to the beginning of 2023, where the world was a much different place. The most advanced publicly available LLM at the time was something called GPT-3, which you know is old news already. Um, I bet most of you haven't even used GPT-3 in whatever, a year and a half. And it's a far more limited model than the chat tune ones we have today. Uh, my company, Langchain, uh, had our website that looked like this. This was actually real, yes, you can I actually went in the Wayback Machine and looked this up. Um, it was based off of uh, BerkshireHathaway.com, which you know is pretty amazing if you go look at it now on your phone. But yeah, the reason I go back to this, um, back then a lot of our exploration about, around building useful apps with LLMs of the day came down to combining several prompts and LLM calls and sequences called chains. Basically, you'd carefully parse the output of one step, pass part of it to the next, maybe do add some other steps for like a vector store or something else. And you have this kind of like, very deterministic, stateful way. Like each step was a chain. Um, each step you can think of as like a state in this workflow. You go from one state to the next in some defined sequence, some defined progression. And hopefully, get something good. And note these chains weren't always, you know, necessarily linear. You could have uh, this was a really popular one that sort of, um, I think, underpinned a lot of the, uh, you know, things that people deploy as RAG these days. And these like sort of chat with your documents or chat with data things. You could have steps that didn't involve LLMs. Uh, this one uses a vector store, basically taking an original query, maybe combining it with some chat history to synthesize it into something that was dereferenced, passing that to a vector store, retrieving your data, using that to ground your generation, basically a giant rag thing, and um, yeah, get some good output. The key bit here, though, is that they were largely deterministic. The LLMs you know, were uh, maybe tasked with like generating some creative output, but like they, would, by and large, were in this, at least this model, we're not involved with um, sort of deciding next steps. And jumping ahead to the future a little bit, uh, it turns out this can work reasonably well, reasonably well with small in-browser models. You saw a few examples already from some of the other talks. Last year when the summit was Google internal only, I actually recorded and built a prototype showing the example of this fully in-browser using a uh, yeah, vector store, web LLM example, um, or something called a llama, which you could run locally on your machine. And this ran fully in the browser, fully client side, worked reasonably well, I would say. Yeah, so that was one way we tried to do something useful with small models. And you know, I think you see a lot of that in production today, so it's a good flow. Another, and one that was kind of really exciting to people, everyone was screaming like, oh, AGI is everywhere, we're all gonna be replaced, the robots are coming, ah. And that's when you take a, uh, yeah, a React agent, where the LM would respond to queries by choosing from a set of tools until it's satisfied that it had, it had resolved the query. And in this case, the LLM has full control over your internal state, so there's no, uh, much less determinism. It just basically will go tool, 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 observe the response, and sort of kind of continue until it's, yeah, maybe has enough information or gives up. And because the states between, tra uh, transitions between states, rather, uh, were not explicitly defined, people became excited by the potential of this to solve really arbitrary problems. But the reliability was really a big problem here. The models at the time were way too finicky. You could do cute things, and maybe if you've tried Langchain before, you might have seen like, oh, who's Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio's girlfriend, and what is her age, race the 
you know, 0.5 power or something ridiculous like that, where, you know, it can do it. And, you know, you give it a web search tool and a calculator. And, you know, Leonardo has a new girlfriend every, what, like six months. So it was kind of a fun test of relevancy outside of training data. Um, but there was nowhere really near reliable enough for production. Um, though people tried very hard and, you know, I think became a little bit frustrated at times. So sidebarring again, I actually uh, tried the OG Langchain React prompt with Chrome's new built-in Gemini Nano, um, and which you know operates in similar sort of text completion models. So, uh, but found similar issues uh, as the early days of 2023, where you had this kind of difficulty with formatting, and you know it could sort of like uh, you can see the prompt here. It's like respond with like a question, then a thought, then an action, then and that's your, like your tool call, and then. Um, yeah, so it, it sort of like duplicates the thought and like tries to call the web search tool and like kind of gets there, but it's, it, yeah, it doesn't quite get as far as it should. So yeah, clearly we're not quite there yet. We had these two different categories of apps, one which was relatively reliable but less flexible, and one that was way more flexible but way less reliable. And a lot of our efforts at Langchain turned towards answering this question of whether we could have both. And yeah, traveling back to the present now, we ended up developing a framework called Langgraph, and this takes this idea that accounts for this rich area between simple chains and full-on autonomous agents, basically allowing developers to tune the amount of agency versus reliability at each step of a flow. In it, you model your task as a graph defining discrete states that each perform some kind of logic and transitions between these states. You can mix and match between developer-provided rails and agentic decision-making as appropriate. So you kind of get, yeah, chains when you need it and deterministic steps, agentic steps when you need it as well. And how exactly does this help? Well, uh, the answer is again context. As we saw earlier, LLMs align better to expectations when you give them more information. So here's an example of that same example of a pretty broad question, what's one type of food to eat? And if the model responds a hamburger, you know, you gotta look at the broader context. That might be good if you're you know, at a part of a McDonald's ordering flow or like a drive-through ordering flow. But if you're at a vegan barbecue, it's actually a pretty bad response because you, know, you didn't provide the right context. And in a multi-step task, if you don't account for this, these differences start to comp uh, compound, resulting in poor results, as you see, with a lot of fully autonomous agents today. And these discrete states can help you basically structure your apps in a way that helps give the LLM the right context at the right time, helping you build these better performing apps with LLMs. And bring it full circle, this is even more important for small models, which can be a little bit, you know, let's say, derpy at some times, that can deviate pretty significantly from expectations, if not carefully prompted and managed. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten this is a web AI conference. So let's look at applying this to a web example, um, something called generative UI, which has been kind of a hot topic lately. So let's say you want to take actions that a user is taking on a page, such as clicks or links or on links or buttons, and use that information to update the look and feel of a web page. And I'm using a, yeah, uh, specifically if I have a personal website, I'm using mine as an example. Let's say I want to use what the user clicks on to determine some highlights for my resume that are relevant. And I want to do this everything client side in the browser. Here's some example actions that a user might take. I mentioned I maintain LangChain.js. I mentioned that I work at Autocode, or that was my previous company. And I also have this whimsical animation on my face. I'm I promise you that'll make sense in a moment. And if you had a naive approach of just passing these events to an LLM along with the content of my resume, I get something like the following. And I'm using 5.3.5 again through Web LLM. This looks okay at first, but if you kind of look at it more closely, it, it tones a little bit weird. It's like not really something you'd want to display to someone. It's very impersonal. And uh, actually, one and two actually have hallucinations. So um, I did maintain and work on a Node.js hosting platform, but not with my tenure at Rumora software. So this will also scale poorly as the number of events grows. I only passed in three, but you can imagine like passing in 50 and having this kind of go all badly. So here's a more strategic way to do this. I've broken the problem down into steps, inspired by a technique called adaptive rag, where I first take the input actions and just try to extract the user's intent on the page. Then I fan out to individual LLM calls that each generate a single highlight for each of those intents with the resume's context, passed in each time. And finally, I add some agency by using the LLM to check for hallucination. The LLM can either choose to say, okay, there's no hallucinations, let's you know, generate that as a highlight. Yes, there are hallucinations, let's start over and try it again. So this is a pretty simple agentic flow that combines some determinism with some agency. And here's what it looks like in practice. There's the whimsical animation of my face as promised. The user clicks on it. It plays it again with a few more sort of uh, squares. They click on the LangChain.js link, goes here, goes back, 
clicks on this autocode link. Let's go back and then, uh, yeah, so scroll up and refresh the page and we can see that we have some quick highlights now. And these look a little bit better. I'll zoom on in on them in a moment. And I do see I'm running out of time, so I do want to blaze through this a little bit faster. But basically, um, yeah, this is what it looks like. A little bit better. It's not perfect, but there's importantly a pathway for continued improvement. It's a bit, you know, there's no hallucinations here. It all looks good. And this, yeah, rather than like prompt engineering and praying, there's like a better pathway to making this better. So there's also a lot more you can do with LangGraph. There's first class support for persistence and interrupting from intermediate states. So you can call it to, uh, you know, if you've heard this term hybrid LM, uh, hybrid development sort of thrown around a few times now. Um, so you can call it to a human with this human loop, loop workflow. Um, after interrupting, this human, in this case, could be even a more powerful LLM that's on, the, on your back end. And you can do that for more sensitive steps. And it also works with or without LangChain modules. And yeah, what, do I, what am I excited about next for client-side models? As I've alluded to a few times, uh, there's already a few, a bit of a roadmap for what's possible as small models become more powerful uh, from like the, you know, sort of what we went through with GPT-3 to GPT-4 to Gemini to whatever. Uh, we're really excited to see more ways of structuring reliable output um, for use outside of chat apps. That's pretty important. You know, having this structured output is really great for these more complex workflows and more general uh, multimodal communities, uh, capabilities rather. And yeah, really excited about the potential distribution engine of Gemini Nano as well as that is built into Chrome and it goes out to you know, billions of people. That's gonna be a huge opportunity for all sorts of new and novel use cases. Yeah, and thank you for listening. Um, some links here that may be uh, interesting on the, yeah, socials, LangGraphJS, uh, this all works in web environments. There's a little bit of custom setup and entry point magic needed, but yeah, thank you all for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.